talk about the act to divide this. Uh, we have to uh, uh, define uh, the, to divide the, the uh, bishops of the, the, this Christian churches uh, into two. Uh, there are those who are permanently uh, uh, well, also in the other Christian meetings for the fourth and the fifth century, and uh, uh, about third, I think, uh, come only on the later uh, uh, second half of the fifth century on. That one uh, point. I'm not sure. I, I think that uh, there is uh, discrepancy in, 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 in this view uh, from the uh, middle of the third century to the second quarter of the fourth century, and uh, it is very very difficult to, to, to follow the, the real um, process on the Christian side. There was a settlement there, there was a legionary camp of the uh, 10th century, oh, of the 10th uh, legion, the census from the end of the 3rd century. Uh, but I don't know what to say about the Christianity there. There is, as, as Martin said, there was at least one Sadducean high, high priest. There, uh, at least there was one bishop in there in uh, the Right, being shorter, I hope everybody can hear me and the microphone is better placed for me. Great. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a very, very great pleasure to be here. Um, I find myself in a happy circumstance where, in fact, my paper might have fitted in any of the three sections we've had today. I've prepared a double-sided handout. On the first side is just a few bits and pieces but on the reverse is um, uh, quite a few extracts from the extant part of the Gospel of Peter. In fact, on that piece of paper, you maybe have over a third of the extant text. Not all of it, but I hope it might be sufficient for you all to follow some of the things that I'm saying if you're not familiar with that text. In the course of this morning's papers, and I dare say in what we'll be doing tomorrow, some of us, we've been exploring and celebrating the way in which the discovery of formerly unknown or lost texts has been able to enliven our fields of study and enrich our understanding of Jesus, Judaism, and Christianity in the first centuries of this common era. It's in this spirit that I now wish to draw our attention, albeit very briefly, to the Gospel of Peter. This Greek text, which is apparently fragmentary, beginning and ending as it does in mid-sentence, includes an account of part of the trial of Jesus, his passion, that is his crucifixion, his resurrection, and its aftermath. It represents the first so-called non-canonical gospel text to be rediscovered, so-called rediscovered in the, com in the modern era, and as such has the potential to add to our sum of evidence of arguably early gospel traditions. And I use the term tradition and its plural advisedly. And of course, some evidence of the situations that gave rise to them. 
the text of what has come to be known as the Gospel of Peter was unearthed from a Christian grave near Achmin, which is near ancient Panopolis, in 1886 to 1887, so that's a good 50 years before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the grave is dated to within the 8th to 12th centuries. And paleographical analysis of the codex suggests an 8th century date. But immediately following the initial publication of the text in 1892, the Gospel of Peter was taken to represent a composition of a much earlier period, sometime in the latter half of the second century. This date seems largely dependent on the identification of the text with one referred to by Eusebius in his ecclesiastical history with the late second century, with a late second century bishop of Antioch. The text in the Achmeen Codex contains a few elements in common with the description preserved by Eusebius, but not so much, I think, to be conclusive. However, the Codex does feature a narrative in the first person, apparently written in the guise of the disciple Peter, including in the final extant verse, I, Simon Peter, and Andrew, my brother, taking our nets, went out to the sea. So in that sense, it is certainly a gospel, if a gospel it be, of Peter. This was sufficient for many scholars, with supporting circumstantial evidence, to identify the discovered text with the gospel of Peter, or capital letters, which was condemned as heretical in the late second century. Nevertheless, marking a revival of interest in this text in the 1980s, John Dominic Crossan, whose work is on the handout, while apparently wishing to uphold the Gospel of Peter identification, attributed much of its content to a so-called cross gospel, his coining, I think, a version of the Jesus, Jesus' passion and resurrection dating from the mid-first century, around the 40s Common Era, and on which the canonical passion narratives those in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are based. Crossan's work reflects the kind of concern that has dominated study of the Gospel of Peter, namely its relationship to the canonical Gospels, the direction of their interdependence, and hence their usefulness as an historical resource. And when I say that, I of course mean their resource for the historical Jesus. From a comparison with the canonical Gospels, several scholars have noted a continuation and intensification of the anti-Jewish tendencies, which are discernible in the passion narratives of Mark, proceeding to Matthew and to John. For example, in his enormous work, The Death of the Messiah, Raymond Brown remarks on the anti-Jewish sentiment, which is, quote, much more prominent in the Gospel of Peter than in canonical Gospels." Close quote. Moreover, in the most recent major work on the Gospel of Peter by Paul Foster, this purple book from which I take the majority of the English, English translation that I use today, the author notes, and I think assumes throughout, quote, it is certainly the case that in the Achmean narrative, the Jews are depicted in a manner that is less just and less measured than in the canonical Gospels. Thus, the narrative again appears to reflect a later period in church history when there had been an intensification of anti-Jewish sentiments as the Christian movement flourished in gentle, Gentile circles, throwing some of Martin's earlier models into some confusion. In contrast, and corresponding to the earlier date which he proposes for the material in the Gospel of Peter, Crossan argues the reverse, that the Gospel of Peter is more positive in its portrayal of Jews and of Judaism than its canonical counterparts. He claims, quote, if with Brown we use increasing an animosity as a general index of sequence and progression, 
Peter comes out, not at the end, but at the beginning, not late, but early. There, at least, the invective is not nearly as lethal as in Matthew and John, close quotation. Yet, even on Crossan's analysis, the Gospel of Peter in its final form itself exhibits dependence on the canonical accounts and includes later redactional material which weaves it together. Therefore, regardless of how we direct the relationship of dependence between the Gospel of Peter and the canonical Gospels, the final text achieved its form probably in the second century at the earliest. Indeed, I, with others, take a reference to the burning of the temple in 726 as a clear allusion suggesting, at the very least, a post-70 date in its final form. Moreover, we might reasonably consider that this final form of the text formed a cohesive narrative recognizable to its composer or redactor and to its earliest readers. Consequently, the presentation of Jews and Judaism in this text is neither a question merely of compositional strata, as it is for Crossan, or historical sources, but is also a question of second century, if we accept a second century date, of second century rhetoric and attitude and relationships. Regardless of source critical theories, Crossan's reading of the text suggests that there are still questions that can be usefully posed regarding the presentation of Jews and Judaism in the Gospel of Peter. And today I intend no more than to outline two principal elements of that portrayal as a springboard for discussion. In what remains of this very short paper, I, I must say I don't intend to venture anything as firm as a bold hypothesis, let alone a conclusion, but I hope to bring um, this further and formally buried evidence to the table. So my first principal element of the portrayal, responsibility for the execution of Jesus. And here it might help to follow the text on the handout. In this regard, the Gospel of Peter represents a distinctive view. While all four canonical Gospels make some attempt to shift responsibility to Jesus' death from Pontius Pilate to the Jewish authorities and or the Jewish people, in the Gospel of Peter, Pilate appears a mere puppet of, as he's called, Herod the King, who remains in control of the entire proceedings, saying, quote, whatever I commanded you to do to him, do, close quote. As in other Gospels, Joseph of Arimathea requests Jesus' body from Pilate, but Pilate, note 2-4, refers that request to Herod. The Gospel begins with an observation, quote, But of the Jews no one washed the hands, nor Herod, nor one of his judges. And when they were not willing to wash, Pilate rose up. It seems reasonable to infer that preceding the extant narrative, there was a description of Pilate's hand-washing, a gesture which in Matthew's Gospel signifies that he is innocent of Jesus' blood. And Pilate indeed claims the same in the Gospel of Peter, 1146. The refusal on the part of the Jews, of Herod and the judges, might correspondingly then stand in token of their default acceptance of responsibility for the condemnation of Jesus. Crossan very recently points out that hand-washing, after the law in Deuteronomy 21, 1-9, is a demonstration of innocence rather than a removal of guilt. Yet, if the motif ought to be interpreted against that biblical background, it remains the case that neither the Jews nor Herod nor any of his judges, Herod's judges, Jesus' judges, it's not entirely clear, make that demonstration of innocence. So they may not remove their guilt, that's not what it's for, but neither do they demonstrate innocence, as we might infer the author has had Pilate do. Moreover, the 
the crucifixion is carried out not as in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John by Roman soldiers, but by the Jewish people themselves. And Pilate handed him over to the people before the first day of the unleavened bread, their festival. So, taking the Lord, they were pushing him while running along. That's from 2.5 to 3.6. That is, it is Jews and not Romans who continue to oversee the crucifixion is made clear in 5.15. And uh, when the antagonist, they, who are carrying out the crucifixion, become troubled and distressed that Jesus might remain on the cross after sunset, a sensibility which Herod, earlier on in the narrative, has pointed out reflects a particular understanding of Deuteronomy 21-23. The sun is not setting in the story. It is simply that those involved have failed to recognize the premature and foreboding darkness that forms a background to Jesus' crucifixion in this as in other gospel stories. This same they don't recognize that. They think the sun is setting and therefore take action to expedite Jesus' death by offering him gall and vinegar to drink. Thus, in the words of the author of the Gospel of Peter, quote, they fulfilled all things and accumulated the sins of their head. 5.17 In a similar vein, when the premature gloom is lifted after Jesus' death, this is met with relief, arguably that in accordance with the Torah, the son had, quote, not yet set on one who had been put to death. And that's, that's um, an idea from Deuteronomy which is appealed to twice explicitly in the text of the Gospel. So, in 6.22 to 23, Then the sun shone, and it was found to be the ninth hour. And the Jews rejoiced and gave to Joseph his body that he might bury it. In this manner, the heaping of responsibility for the death of Jesus onto Jews exclusively and even ordinary Jews, not the authorities, not simply Herod, seems to present, in line with Brown's view, a fiercer anti-Jewish slant than the other passion narratives. However, the story continues with the aftermath of the crucifixion and the presentation of Jews in the Gospel then begins to take a new direction. So the second element the repentance of the Jewish people, and the authorities' deception. Immediately following the burial of Jesus, not the death, but the burial of Jesus, the Jews and the elders and the priests experience an unanticipated change of heart. From 725, knowing what evil they had done to themselves, they began to lament and say, Woe to our sins! The judgment and the end of Jerusalem is at hand. Thus, not only ordinary Jews, in the thinking of Crossan, but at least some authority figures, as they here presented, the elders and the priests, give every impression of repenting their recent action. In a subsequent portion of the text, at 8.28 and following, the scribes and the Pharisees and the elders respond to the response of the people. They heard that all the people grumbled and beat their chests, saying, If at his death these greatest signs had happened, behold how just he was. This reported response of the people is one that distinguishes them from their authority. So whereas at 725 they all lament, here this reported response of the people distinguishes them from their authority. As a result of their remorse, the people's remorse, the elders, instead of joining in the general lamentation, undertake to defend themselves against deception by securing Jesus' tomb. So, quoting 8, 29-30, The elders were afraid and came to Pilate, petitioning him and saying, Give to us soldiers that I, interesting change of person there, that I may guard his tomb for three days, lest his disciples come and steal him, and the people suppose that he is risen from the dead, and they might do evil things to us. 
They are granted this request, as they are in Matthew's Gospel, and in contrast with that canonical account and in apparent negligence of the Sabbath, the elders join the Roman guard in their watch over the tomb. In 1038, the Roman soldiers wake the centurion and the Jewish elders to inform them that they have seen the event which the Gospel of Peter luridly describes in the preceding verses. They have seen the heavens open and two men of much brightness descending and entering the tomb after the stone which sealed the entrance had rolled away of its own accord. Being awake, the elders were then able to witness for themselves at first hand the exit from the tomb of the two men and a third whose head surpassed the heavens, we must infer, this is the risen Jesus. The Gospel writes explicitly that they hear a voice from heaven and a reply from the cross which follows the men out of the tomb. This is clearly then no deception wrought by Jesus' disciples, nor do the elders interpret it as such, but it is now that those elders cease to fill, cease to fill the role of defendant against deception, instead becoming a per perpetrators of a deception of their own. In 1147-48, Then they all came and were beseeching and entreating Pilate to command the centurion and his soldiers to say nothing of what they had seen. For it is better, they said, for us to incur the liability of a great sin before God and not to fall into the hands of the people of the Jews and to be stoned. Therefore, according to Crossan's reading of his reconstructed cross gospel, this tradition distinguishes the penitent people of the Jews from the authorities of the Jews who, despite their first-hand witness of the resurrection, refuse to repent and attempt to cover up the truth. Crossan argues, quote, If only, says this gospel, those awful Jewish authorities have not lied to their own people, they too would have known all about the resurrection of Jesus and would have confessed him just as the Romans did, close quote. So for Crossan, that is the attitude towards the Jewish people and the Jewish authorities encapsulated in the Gospel of Peter. For the Gospel of Peter, Crossan maintains, if only in relation to the Jewish people remains possible and the text stands towards Jews as opposed to Jewish authorities is remarkably positive as far as he's concerned. Yet this reading, his reading, I think leaves certain questions unanswered, and these are the open questions I may leave open, but here they are. Certainly, by 1148, the Jewish authorities fear a vengeful populace. Let yet the path of remorse on the one hand and fear on the other is not altogether straightforward. As we have already noted at 725, Immediately following the burial of Jesus, the elders and the priests join the Jews in lamentation. Moreover, this presentiment of judgment on Jerusalem does not manifest itself in entirely positive terms. Indeed, these same lamenters are reported in 726 as seeking the eponymous Peter and his companions as, quote, evildoers and those wishing to destroy the temple. Lamentation and remorse does not render these people harmless or positive from a being a Christian disciple point of view. Furthermore, the grumbling and chest beating reportedly followed from the great signs that accompanied Jesus' death. Behold the signs that occurred and see how just he was, 8.28. Yet, this report is not apparent in the Gospel's own account. The darkness at noon is not met with an admission of just how just Jesus was, but with a plan to accelerate his death. Admittedly, the quaking of, of the earth when his corpse was laid upon it prompts great fear in 621, but that is soon transformed to rejoicing when the sun returns explicit knowledge of the evil that they have done, in the words of the Gospel text, 
is only reported following Jesus' burial and not following the signs that accompany his crucifixion, as 8.28 would suggest. And that knowledge, that explicit knowledge of the evil they have done, applies to, as we, as we might term them for the sake of the text, ordinary Jews, elder and priest alike. There's much more that could be said, but I'm virtually at my time limit. And certainly this is not the limit of a treatment of Jews, Jewish scripture, Jewish belief, and Jewish practices in the Gospel of Peter. There's a lot more to go into. Yet I hope it's sufficient for the moment and for our present purposes to open some questions and hint at further avenues of inquiry, and at the very least, warn against the difficulty of an imposing and overarching pattern in either direction or any easy category on the final form of this very complicated text. Thank you. Um, so the question for those who didn't hear was, uh, I've emphasized the fact that repentance follows after the burial of Jesus rather than after his crucifixion. And the lady very wisely asks, what is the significance of this? To which I think I can only answer, I'm not sure what the significance of it is, but I think I can say what the significance of it isn't. In that, um, if repentance is meant to be shown for the act of crucifixion, then that isn't what happened. There is, there is some remove between the act of execution and then the realization of what they've done. So why that has been put at some remove is more difficult to say. Certainly, the, as in other gospel accounts, as in the canonical gospels, um, Jesus' executioners, be they Roman or Jewish, Roman in the canonical instance, Jewish here, do not take part in that burial but any picture which sometimes is put forward in secondary literature on this topic that sees the crucifixion happen and then suddenly everybody start tearing their hair out and say, look what we've done. That, that is a false representation of what happens in the text. Though if the perpetrators act, and then there's a little delay, and other things happen, and then there's the report of, of lamentation and knowledge of what they've done. So I think the significance is rather, what is the significance of the delay? Why the delay? And I'm not sure that I can offer any answer to that, but rather that I think it's significant to recognize there might be a significance. Um, so the, the question was about the proliferation of terminology in relation to Jewish individuals and Jewish groups within the text. So we not only have the Jews, um, but also the elders, priests, scribes, Pharisees. To some extent, that's a problem, um, a methodological question that's raised by most of the gospel traditions in that there seems to be this collection of terms which are not necessarily used in a consistent way. What is interesting about the Gospel of Peter, as you pointed out, is that um, the Gospel of Peter seems to adopt the favorite terminology of a range of canonical evangelists. So the fourth evangelist, the Gospel of John, tends to refer, though not exclusively, the Gospel of John does refer to lots of different Jewish groups, particularly Pharisees, elders, priests, but um, to the Jews as preponderance of that term, just the Jews. Um, the passion narratives of Matthew, Mark, and Luke tend to speak of 
chief priests, priests and elders, scribes and elders, Pharisees mainly being reserved, and scribes and Pharisees as a group reserved for earlier non-passion material. The fact that we have all of them turning up has uh, mainly turned up in relation to the question of dependence on gospel tradition. And that can go either way. So if you're crossing, you say, look what we have here. We have lots of different names for Jews being used, and what Matthew and John and Luke have done is come along and pick their favorite. I would say my, my tendency, which I probably can't defend fully at the moment, is to lean in the other direction and say that what we have here is a, a smorgasbord of every possible term that you could use that he's gathered together to make sure that all his bases are covered, so that if you're used to reading John, if you're used to reading Matthew, if you're used to reading Mark, then perhaps you find a recognizable Jewish term within this, this, this account. But it's difficult to make anything of it either way, maybe. That may be so, and uh, it occurred to me that uh, the, the difference I pointed out with those who, who lament with the people and then those who don't, um, I think those the pesky elders, though, keep turning up as a, a, a linking form across all the different groups, though. So Pharisees, I think, stand out as only turning up in one bit when they go and ask for, for the guard. As, as in Matthew's Gospel, but elders is, is a more frequent term. So, possibly used with a little more care, but not in such a way as to protect any given grouping from, if you like, contact or crossover with others. Yes, and priests are a major feature of all, all the passion narratives as well, so the Gospel of Peter is is following within that line. It's certainly what's interesting in Peter is that you get the introduction of Herod, um, who you find, of course, in Luke, but not in Mark or Matthew or in, this way in, in John. So you've got Herod turning up. And Herod, in some ways, taking the place not only of Pilate, but of the role that is taken in Mark and Matthew by the high priest, by um, Caiaphas, as his name is in John. So... Um, priests are significant, but priests, in comparison with the canonical accounts, may be losing some of their significance by this rather flamboyant introduction of Herod as uh, overseer of the whole proceeding. Do you think 